Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is March 30th, 2021. And today, uh, again, we have another interview that I've been wanting to have for many years. Today, we are interviewing the uh, Mark Noggle, and Mark is most well-known in the progressive and post-Mormon communities for his work with quitmormon.com, which is a website that emerged a few years ago to help people who want to resign from the Mormon church to expedite that process. Uh, Mark is an attorney here in Salt Lake City. Mark Noggle, welcome to Mormon Stories Podcast. Thank you, John. My pleasure to be here. It's great to have you. Thank you. All right. So uh, I think it would be cool to kind of have you give an introduction to what uh, Quit Mormon is, and and then we'll go into your story. And then I've got a ton of questions from our listeners that I wanted to share. Well, so uh, let's let's start from the top. Sure. Uh, QuitMormon.com is a nonprofit organization. Uh, we were founded after we realized that this was uh, the service we were providing was uh, needed or wanted. Um, I started doing these resignations, just posting them on the ex-Mormon subreddit uh, in early March 2015 and maybe did 30 or 50. I started stapling them up on my home office wall. I was like, this is cool. I'm going to see how many I can get. I'm going to get 1,000. <laughs> I think first I said I want 200. <laughs> and I said, okay, I got 200. Let's get to 1,000. Uh, and I never – I mean, I thought it would take 10 years to get to 1,000. Um, but uh, in November 2015, the uh, the church handbook policy leak about LGBTQ families and children – came out uh, and people were outraged. So I went back on the, the subreddit and said, hey, I'm still doing these if you guys want. And um, I got 2,000 requests in 24 hours. Um, so I started plugging away, doing them by hand. People were very generous, offered volu to volunteer, volunteered to build me a website, um, streamline the process. Uh, and I, we eventually settled with uh, uh, a guy in uh, California, his name's Ryan. Uh, he built the website. He's essentially the co-founder of quitmormon.com um, and um, started helping me automate the process so we could handle thousands. Um, and we've done to date about 80,000 uh, through the website. And I, I always tell people it's about total. We've maybe done up to 90,000 because I didn't keep track of how many I did by hand back in the day. Hmm. Um, so, that, I mean, that's the story. Um, You've but submitted 90,000, but... How many confirmed? Uh, I believe we it's about fifty seven thousand right now. So there's uh, a backlog of thirty. A backlog, ish. you could call it a backlog. Yeah, there's <laughs> going to be about there's a nice big chunk there where they changed how they would receive them, uh, and people just didn't go back to it. Which I'm proud of those people in a way. Uh, uh, they just didn't care once they submitted their resignation. It was done. Uh, and in a way, that's kind of what we're going to be moving to as an organization is saying, let's get your resignation submitted. Let's get you to feel like you're out and then let's help you move on to the next part of your life. I love it. So we'll talk about all that today. Well, good. Well, it's, it's great to have you. And uh, maybe let's just begin. I, I'd love, and I know my listeners would love to hear a little bit about your your Mormon story, your background, and the kind of stuff that led to you, I guess, leaving the church, losing your faith in the church, and then what in your life led you to, to provide this valuable service to sure. Mormons? Yeah. Well, I was born and raised in Orem, Utah. Nice. Uh, at the time was, you know, where all the BYU professors lived. Um, uh, it was 96% Mormon. We were one of them. Uh, my parents are both converts. Um, and my dad's actually kind of funny. He was born into Mormonism in Kansas. Um, left the church once, uh, and then was reconverted back after he met my mom and had brought her out here. Uh, my grandparents had moved to Utah since, uh, and so he had brought her out here from Larned, Kansas, and she thought this place was amazing. Um, she loved the mountains. She went to a BYU basketball game. They thought it was great. So it's not the love. Yeah, got back into Mormonism <laughs> uh, before I was born. Uh, reconverted, got baptized. Um, and so me and my younger brother, uh, we grew up LDS, uh, you know. Um, I, for one, as a child, was terrified. Uh, I was so scared of Satan. 
I was scared that I was going to do something wrong that would send me to hell forever. Um, I, once I turned eight years old, I was actually baptized by my dad, but confirmed by Dallin H. Oaks. What? Yeah. His uh, How? grandson was in my ward and baptized at the same time as me. Hmm. So that's a fun one. Do you remember him at all? Uh, no, not more than just a face. Um, I don't remember the confirmation. I mean, I remember the day. I remember my grandma gave me a book of Mormon as a gift. And I remember being like, what? I have like five of these at home, <laughs> but I had my name on it. So that was, that was cool. Um, and that, that was it. I mean, that was eight years old. I was kind of like, wow, okay, I'm, it's on. I've got to be serious. Like I got to do all the stuff, right? Uh, I can't be, you know, breaking any of the rules or making God angry or, or anything like that. This is for real. That's what they tell you, right? Eight years old, you're responsible. Um, so fast forward, I mean, we go through this, I, I do, I do Cub Scouts, I do Boy Scouts. My brother, Sean, he would come home from church every Sunday with a migraine headache and throw up. Mm. He hated church. Mm. I didn't really like church, but mm -hmm. I was like, we have, I got, we have to do this. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, by the time I was 12, 13, going through maturation, getting hormones, like there's something wrong with my, there's something wrong with me. There's something wrong with my body. This isn't how it's supposed to be. I'm not supposed to feel these feelings. I'm not supposed to be looking at girls. I'm not supposed to be doing any of this stuff. Um, and one day my dad who had been just on AOL and get the CDs and go on AOL.com for his 199 free minutes or whatever it was, <laughs> started researching Mormon history. Um, and I think he was always a skeptic. Uh, he always, he what was just, his profession. He was a private investigator. Oh, so for like divorces and stuff, he would do divorces. He would do insurance claims. Uh, he would travel all over. Um, my dad was for, in my mind was like the coolest guy. He would like go to Montreal and like interview people or like fly to Hawaii and take video of this guy who had a neck brace, but was a soccer coach. My dad let the air out of his tire, hmm. uh, and then filmed him. He came out with a, with the soccer ball pump, pumped up the, bike tire with his neck brace on. <laughs> so he was faking. Yeah, he was faking. Yeah. So like that, that, so he helped, he basically helped uncover fraud. Yeah. He would do that too. Yeah. yeah. And then he'd do the divorce stuff and whatever else. Yeah. Um, so for me, my, my dad was like the coolest guy. And you know, when you turn 20 or whatever, you realize that your parents aren't as brilliant as you thought they were. But, um, at the time my dad was like the man, uh, and he would sit in church, uh, when I started, when I was like 12 or 13, he would sit in church on the front row. He sat in the front row every Sunday. Uh, and he would like, anytime the Bishop would maybe say something he disagreed with or a talk would say something, he'd go <laughs> in the front row. And you know, I'm there like, this sucks already. I don't want to be here, but I have to, but dad, what's going on with dad down the row here. And mom's like trying to keep him under control. <laughs> hand on the, you know, scratch his back, whatever. Um, but one day he just sat me down. He called me and he's like, Mark, I have something really serious to talk to you about. And I was like, Oh, my parents are getting divorced or you know, who knows what it was. And he says, I've been on the internet a lot researching the church and none of it's real. Joseph Smith lied. This is all BS. Uh, can I say? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He said, this is all bullshit. Do you remember the, kind of your age in the approximate year? Yeah, I was like 13. And so that would have been what year about? Let's see. I was born in 85, so I was like 98, okay. 99. Um, wow. That's so, that's early. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, he was using the AOL CDs to yeah, get on the internet. I remember, yeah. So uh, I felt immediate relief. I thought, Oh my God, this is the best thing that's ever happened. Mm. Uh, it, it just drained all of the anxiety out of my body. Mm. Uh, I went for a walk uh, afterwards and just was like on top of the world, excited that this meant that I, all this pressure that I was feeling just at 13 years old about my life and how I was supposed to live it and what I was supposed to do uh, was gone. Just with my dad being like, hey, don't worry about this anymore. Mm -hmm. Um. My mom didn't take it as well, hmm. uh, you know, and I, you've probably heard this story 800 times, but she, 
um, she thought he was cheating on her. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. Satan had found him. Um, yeah, because... D- yeah. Delivered a blow to our family. Uh, he had always told her, you'll know when I'm, uh, you know, no longer in love with you when I won't go to the temple with you or something like that. They had some mm-hmm. kind of thing. So, you know, she thought this was the end of the world. Um, but she was a convert. So she... Uh, said, okay, you know, she actually came around fairly quickly. And as, you know, as we all had, she'd been watching him on the end of the pew too (laughs) for the last year, uh, seeing how he was behaving and seeing his like reactions. We would always take trips to Las Vegas or any chance we got to leave for the weekend so we didn't have to do church stuff. We did that for that year. Yeah. So, um, but she came around relatively quickly, uh, three or four months actually, and said, okay, fine. I've always gone to church though. So if we're not going to be going to this church, we have to find another church, which for me and my brother, we were like, Oh man, (laughs) here we go again. Uh, but we went to an evangelical church in Orem, uh, for, I think it was almost five years. Mm. Uh, and my dad became like a, a Sunday school teacher there, and we got really involved. I was involved in the youth group. Was it Center Point or something else? It was at the time. It was called Evangelical, F- the Evangelical Free Church okay. of Orem. Okay, Pastor Scott. So, uh, and they had their own building right across from Orem High School. We went to Orem High School, so, uh, and we did you know the camping trips and the you know the youth group. I went on a missions trip to. Tijuana with wow. the, with the group and Fun. all that stuff. Got baptized in that church. I wore a cross to high school. Oh, uh, every day. Wow. You know, I was the Christian kid, right? Ooh. Because that's at least it's in a religion, right? At least I'm. Yeah. You know, I'm not just some kind of heathen Satanist. Right. Yeah, yeah. I still believe. So, uh, but about you know, eighteen, and my brother was over that like within a a week or two of going. Uh, but I was the kind of the same way buying right back in like, okay, well, this is how I'm supposed to live. This is what Jesus wants me to do. Uh, this is what I'm supposed to do to get to heaven and live my life this way. X, Y, Z. Um, but by about 18 and my brother and I believe it or not at, you know, 15, 16, 17, we were having like arguments about it. Like, and I remember one time, I said, I looked at my brother. I can't remember what he was doing. And I was like, Sean, is this what Jesus would want you to do? <laughs> and he goes, Mark, what the f- are you talking about? <laughs> this is the same thing. This is what, this is the same thing as the Mormonism that we were in. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I kind of like at that moment, I was like, oh, okay. Uh, and we, my brother and I just kind of just faded away while my parents stayed very involved uh, and kept going to that church for, at least a few years after until they moved to Colorado Springs. So that's the rundown. Did you move with them or I did not. So I went to the university of Utah and they moved to Colorado Springs. My brother went to the air force Academy. Nice. Uh, So they moved there to kind of support him and be there with him. Nice. Were your parents, did you tell your parents you stopped believing in, in their brand of Christianity and were they disappointed or? Yeah. I remember like, I was 18. So, and I'm, I've never been, I was never a rebellious kid. If mom and dad said, do it, I, I did it for the most part. I mean, we all have our brand of rebellion. Right. But, uh, I remember one Sunday I just said, you know, the Liga MX final is on today. Soccer final. I'm going to watch that. I'm not going to church. And my mom didn't know what to say. (laughs) Uh, and that was just kind of it. I just stopped going after that. Mm. You liberated yourself. I guess so. And in your mind, did you process it intellectually? Like, is there a God? Is Jesus real? Is the Bible true? Did you do any intellectual processing at that point? Not at that point. Okay. At that point, I just was like, this isn't working for me. I don't feel good at church. I don't feel good after church. Mm-hmm. I don't like the buildup to go to church. I hate getting dressed up to go to church. Um, I liked hanging out with the people at church and the youth group. And honestly, that probably would have kept me going. Uh, except one Sunday they sat us down and told us we couldn't date anyone that wasn't a part of the faith. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is the same thing that I just came from. Mm -hmm. So, and that was really kind of one of the last straws. I was like, you made this really weird for me. 
I was having fun. These were my friends, but I, I don't really care anymore. Okay. So, of course, all heathen go to the University of Utah. That's just a joke, uh, fellow Utes. Um, <laughs> but, no, but you go to the U. Yeah. And what's the U like? Um, honestly, I don't think I had, like, I wish. And I guess that's how it is always, right? Youth is wasted on the young. But I... I just sat in my dorm room. I played video games and went to class and did my work and that's it. I didn't make a lot of friends. I was kind of nervous about it. I didn't know how to interact with like normal people in a way. Um, so, and you know, University of Utah is still what? 60% LDS, mm -hmm. you know? So it's like, um, yeah, I, I, I did my stuff. I went to class, graduated in three years. What was your degree? Political science. Oh, nice. What do you want to do? Uh, I thought, you know, I, I'll be in the CIA or I'll go to the State Department or I'll do something really cool. Mm -hmm. But I didn't. <laughs> I, I kind of did the same thing. I was political yeah. science at BYU and then okay. took the LSAT and was going to go to law school. Right so, That's the path, right? That's the that's path. That's really idea. I, I had one. I remember one professor saying, if you're here for a job, you're in the wrong place. So we're not teaching you any skills here, mm. <laughs> teaching you how to think, which yeah. for me, I was like, oh no. <laughs> it's not a bad major, yeah, actually, sure. but it's it's not great for jobs. Sure. Okay. So you graduate poli-sci from the U about what year? That was in 2006. Okay. Yep. And went. Uh, I actually went to law school in Southern California in San Diego for a year and then transferred back to the U for two years. So you did the U law school? Yes, sir. Okay. And did you have an idea what type of law you wanted to practice, what you were getting into law for? So, no. Yeah. I did it because when I was a kid, I did a mock trial in sixth grade, and I had uh, so much fun doing the trial that I was like, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, and I just kind of always had law school on the back burner. But, you know, when you're in a well, poli-sci major, you see all the maybe the possibilities and start dreaming. But they really do just funnel you straight down that LSAT path. Yeah. Okay. So you do law school yep. and, uh, become a, I guess you stay in Utah. Did, did you become private practice lawyer guy? Or? So the, the, uh, partner I had at the time, my romantic partner, uh, did not pass the Utah bar Whoa. and I passed the Utah bar. And we said like, maybe this is our shot. Like, let's get out of Utah. Let's, let's leave. Um, and so we went to Seattle and took the Washington bar. Uh, and I started doing like family law here and there, but when you're a 20, what was I? 23 year old, 24 year old, like punk kid, like I'm still a punk kid, but at 23, 24 going out there trying to interview to be an attorney, you know, have people take you serious. It's just not happening. So, uh, you know, I did piecemeal work here and there, uh, and eventually got the opportunity to go to Southern California, uh, and, and work there, uh, and start an immigration uh, division with my then romantic partner as well. Um, she was actually the one who got hired to do that. She was working in immigration law. Uh, and then I just kind of came on and, and helped build that division. So your focus in Seattle became immigration law? Uh, hers did. I was doing family law and then okay. it was another opportunity. It was like, well, now we can go to California and try, try that. So I took the California bar. Uh, so I'm licensed in three States, but back in Utah, only active here. Okay. So what, it, uh, tell us what, what led you to end up doing quit Mormon? Uh, like I said, I just started doing it for family and friends. Uh, there were some people that are like, man, how do I get out of this? And I was like, well, around what year was that? Uh, 20 early. Well, I had done it a couple of times, like in 20, 2010 and 2012, just for like friends. Okay. So let's, let's back up. So yeah. For the, we have a lot of people who listen who have never been Mormon, yeah. ex-Jehovah's Witnesses, ex-Catholics, ex-Evangelicals, just people who are curious. Yeah. So they kind of maybe don't understand what's going on. So Mormons get baptized at eight. Yeah. They, well, they get blood. Well, why don't you take us through the process of, you know, baby blessings, baptism, kind of what the church records entails, and then, um, and then kind of what would lead someone to want to uh, have their name removed from the records of the church? 
So please jump in and fill in any gaps. Uh, honestly, this is something that I like try to distance myself from. Okay. Uh, but when you're born, right, you, uh, you get a baby blessing. Uh, as a Mormon priesthood. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> as a Mormon, a priesthood blessing, right? Yeah. Um, but essentially put your name on the records. Yep. Right. Creates a, creates a file. Yep. Starts a file. file yeah. Attaches you to this person and that person and this person. Yeah. Mom and dad, grandpa, grandma, all the way down. Um, and, uh, then when you turn eight, you get baptized because you're now responsible for your own actions. Uh, when you're 12, as a man, as a male, you become a deacon. You get the ironic priesthood. Mm -hmm. uh, let's and just see. to be clear, yeah. the baptism the baptism at eight means you're an official member. Correct. When you're confirmed, uh, when you're blessed as a baby, you're not an official member yet. Correct. Okay. And we're keeping, uh, the church is keeping record of all of this, right? Yeah. Every yeah. time something like this happens, they're keeping record down to they're taking attendance every Sunday. Yeah. Right. And who knows where that goes? Yeah. Um, and I will also say, we don't know what the church, how they do this, or maybe we do. Maybe you've talked to someone that knows, but uh, I don't personally know how the church keeps these records. We don't know if they're all in paper files. We don't know if they're all on a server, both. Who knows um, where these things. So you get baptized, you get your ironic priesthood, you get your... Um, the blessing you get where they tell you your future the patriarchal blessing patriarchal yeah. blessing uh, you go on your mission which before that you get the melchizedek priesthood right uh, you get married sealed in the temple for time and all eternity that's on the records so uh and again it comes down they'll keep attendance they know who's supposed to be where and when you move they'll change your address for you and send the new bishop a letter saying hey look out for this guy um, and that's, that's, that's something that w was actually really, can be really distressing. So as an example, you know, I was excommunicated, my wife resigned. We, uh, we did not want to be harassed in the new place that we moved to because we had such a bad experience. And so we move to Salt Lake and we don't let our bishop or stake president know where we're moving to for our children. And they start asking in-laws, neighbors, everyone they can, can we get the Delin's address so that we can continue contacting their children mm -hmm. about membership? And and a lot of people feel bothered or harassed by that that level of, I don't know, inquiry slash investigation. Infringement. Slash yeah. in, what? Infringement. Infringement of privacy, privacy right? Privacy, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, so they follow you wherever you go and they call your, they call your parents, they call your siblings, grandparents, neighbors, whatever they can to track you down and to keep kind of following you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so people, uh, people that I knew were experiencing that. Um, you so know, people that had just stopped attending. Yeah. I don't want to get these emails about when the word party is anymore, or, uh, I don't want the Bishop showing up asking me when I'm coming back to church or the home teachers. I remember as a kid, it was our job. We had one kid in our Boy Scout troop who wasn't Mormon and obviously wasn't going to be, but it was still our job to go to his house, ask him if he was coming to church on Sunday, every Sunday. Uh, and you could just, now looking back, I could just see the exhaustion like on his and his mother's face every time they'd open the door and we were standing there. <laughs> but at the time we're like, why don't you get this? This is going to be, this is, we're saving you, right? Yeah. So I give and I try to, uh, I try to see that side of it because these people absolutely think they're doing the right thing. I know, right? They're, they're just being kind. They're being kind. They just Loving want you Christ -like. to go to heaven with them. Yeah. Right? So I, I try to see that side. But uh, if you resign, if you, if you, let's say you stop going to church and you stop going a year ago, um, the method for you to stop that contact, stop them reaching out to you is to call the bishop, Right? and say, uh, hey, Bishop, so-and-so, I please stop calling me, right? Which is takes a lot by itself. Um, you know, not everyone is predisposed to have that kind of confidence and take care of their own business in that way. Um, and then if he takes your call, or he will take your call, but if he takes your call, he's going to say, uh, well, we need to have a meeting about this. You know, I, I'd like a chance to talk to you, 
right? Which then means you have to get in the car or get on your bike or walk down the street and go meet him at his office at the church in potentially a quiet, empty building and talk to this guy that you haven't seen in a year and you really don't want to be bothered by uh, about your faith and your transgressions and what you've done wrong. Why you're actually here is because of Satan and you know how he's taken over your life, not because you don't want to be bothered anymore. Yeah. Uh, and then he may or may not. And I'll, I'll just have to say, yeah. in Mormonism, there's a real problem with boundaries. Bishops right. feel like, and they're 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 often very good, well intentioned men, but they feel comfortable asking you, "Do you touch yourself? You know, what underwear are you, are you wearing? The right underwear, the garments? Are you?" Um, you know, have you done any sins? Have you had extramarital sex? You know, are you looking into pornography? Just they'll ask you invasive questions about your private sex life. Even if you're married, do you engage in oral sex? Like the types of questions that bishops will ask you, not to mention just kind of this well-intentioned, but often, um, condescending kind of attitude of like, what sin did you commit? Have you fallen out of, you know, worthiness in some way. And then how can we step in to help bring you back? It, it just, it, in a Mormon context, it's all very natural, but once you no longer believe, and then of course there's the problem of privacy because if the Bishop, you know, the Bishop meets regularly with other ward members, which especially if you're in Utah can be neighbors, people that your kids go to school with employers, employers, exactly. And so you never know what information is going to be shared with other people, true or false information, things that could smear your reputation, the gossip, the rumor mill. So there can be real, there can be real threats to privacy that can that can uh, also impact your family relationships, your job, your employment, your kids, and their, their standing with other friends in the community. So there's a lot at stake as soon as the the rumor mill starts buzzing. And you're talking about best case, well intentioned people, right? But you give some of the you give anyone power, power over a nation, over a state, over a community. It's bound to be abused, yeah. and there's not, as far as I know, there aren't checks on that power within the Mormon community. A, a, a man, the bishop, is his words is the final word in that community. As far as I understand, I remember there were boundary disputes in our ward that the Bishop resolved, which yeah. made no sense even then to me as a 12 year old kid. Like, why is this guy in charge of deciding that thing? There's this saying, there's a scripture in Mormonism that says it's the Lord talking supposedly. And it says, whether by mind voice or my servant, it is the same. And so we're taught that a Mormon Bishop literally speaks for God. Right. And there's, you're not allowed to criticize your bishop publicly. You're not allowed to disagree with your bishop publicly, um, culturally. And, and you know, the bishop is inspired to speak for God. And that there's that's a lot of power. When I meet people in my community, and I live in Utah County, uh, that and, and they say, oh, well, I'm a former bishop. They expect a certain response from me that gives them power. That gives them, oh, well, deference, sir. What, what, what do you say, sir? Um, and they're shocked when they don't get it from me. Uh, so that's, that's the community. That's the, that's the thinking that you see. And, and even though a bishop serves on average five years, there's this saying in Mormonism, once a bishop, always a bishop. So sure. you keep, you keep uh, referring to someone as Bishop Smith or Bishop Jones even if they were released as bishop 20 years ago. Like you, the president. You keep that, you keep that title. Yep. Yeah. So, so there's a lot at stake. Right. Um, and so um, you don't want to go through it, right? When we did it, uh, when my dad and mom finally said, okay, we're going to resign, uh, my dad got some letter from the internet that said, we'll, basically, we'll sue you, stop doing all this stuff, stop, stop contacting us. Uh, mailed it to the bishop, mailed it to the stake president, and I think mailed it to church headquarters. And that that, that approach that emerged, I, I've, I've you know I've been aware of that approach for a long time, and it, it's kind of a head scratcher. But um, you know this idea of using an attorney to threaten threaten the church or legal language to threaten the church, someone would go, wow, that that's awful harsh, right? 
Yeah. And I'll get people saying, can we tone down this language that's in the letter? Can I line out things? And well, from your perspective, yeah. why speak to the church in, in the framework of legal language? What is it about that? So for me, actually, I, well, <laughs> I'll just say, I'll answer my own question. Just, yeah. The church cares about, you know, it, yeah. it, it, it doesn't like to be sued. Right. It cares about its money, its assets. And so that's a way to have power when you are otherwise kind of powerless. Sure. And for me, and the the way I started doing this was not, I never thought we'd sue the church, right? I never, I never expected that to be a con like an eventual consequence. I always just thought they would do it, you know, just do the right thing. And putting myself, I said, you know, as an attorney, I can be your agent, uh, you know, for the people that are resigning and I can just stand between you and the church. So once I'm an attorney, the church no longer can con legally, ethically can no longer contact you directly. Uh, they have to go through your attorney. It's an extra protection. Right. So that's kind of, that was more what I was thinking at the time. And then the legal language in the letter is actually just standard language that was, I think is probably very similar to the letter my dad sent. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but yeah, that's, that's what I decided I wanted to do with this is say like, Oh, I'll just, I'll just be your attorney. I'll just put myself on basically on record uh, to my friend. I'm your attorney now. And if they, if they contact you, just be like, Oh, here's my attorney's information. Go through them, go through him. Yeah. Um, and so for a while there, I did get contact from a lot of bishops. I'd get emails from bishops and please pass on this pamphlet to brother so-and-so. And, -so. and what, what did the pamphlet say? Oh my gosh. So they, they actually used to, if you did kind of your own method, you'd send them, send your letter to the church headquarters. They would send back a letter saying, this is for local processing. You need to contact your bishop. This is a local ecclesiastical matter. And then the pamphlet would be like returning to Christ or, you know, some kind of thing to try to say like, Hey, we're good guys. And we're just trying to help you. Um, I wish I, I, maybe I can find a copy of it. But Was it at some point there's, didn't the church send some sort of correspondence that's like, when you resign, you're losing yeah. all the blessings of eternity. Yeah. Your marriage is null, your yeah. temple ceiling is null and void. Your salvation is null and void. You know, just, yeah. what was that? Uh, basically just what you said. Okay. Uh, it was that just a pamphlet or a letter? Uh, or? No, that would be in the letter. Okay. And this is a very serious ecclesiastical matter. And, and actually that one would come from the bishop and that, that's what, well, that's what my family got back from the bishop was basically like, Hey, you're going to lose everything. You're going to not be, you know, you're no more access to heaven. Um, we're canceling all your ceilings. Your baptism will no ha longer have effect. Um, all of that stuff, all that threatening language. And how does that make people feel terrified? Even if they don't believe, isn't that kind of interesting? Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I, I've said it, I've said it before, but I, it took me till I was 31 years old to be over Mormonism to be like, Oh, none of that actually matters. I still had things pop up in my life where I was, my response was the Mormon response. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. way I was programmed as a child. To and be. you didn't even serve a mission or like do I, I early morning seminary. Yeah. So the wiring and the conditioning runs really deep, extremely deep. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's in you by the time you're three years old. Yeah. So, yeah. um, yeah. so the threatening letters and y you know, <laughs> you can be a bulwark against that. Yeah. Uh, and that was, that was kind of the idea. Uh, started just doing that for friends here and there and it, it worked. They would send the, the letter back to me that was like, Hey, just so you know, we've removed brother or sister, whatever their names are, um, from church records. Cool. Let's put that on your wall. That's fun. Yeah. Okay. And, and so you started doing that just for friends here and there. Yep. And then, uh, and then when did it, you you already mentioned this kind of in the intro intro, but yeah. when did you kind of say, "Hey, I really"? When and why did you say, "I kind of want to be the go to guy on on the internet on on ex Mormon Reddit"? I kind of want to make this a uh, a passion or a pursuit. I never wanted to be that guy. Okay, um, <laughs> I never expected this to happen. Uh, I thought, you know, this is fun. Uh, my dad was like the biggest anti Mormon you could ever meet. Uh, like militant anti-Mormon to the point that it like affected his life still. Right. Because he wasn't able to move on. Um, so I was like, this is fun. Like kind of honoring dad, do, you know, do this stuff. And then when I went on Reddit in November, 2015 and said, Hey, I'll, I'll do this. I've been doing this. It works. 
send them over. Here's my email address. And it just exploded. And from there, I had people contacting me saying, hey, can you come? We're going to do a mass resignation downtown. Can you come be there for that? Accept resignations. So, okay, sure. What was your Reddit handle at the time? Chubbs Gato. Chubbs Gato. It's still. C-H-U-B-B-S. C-H-U-B-S underscore Gato. Gato, like cat. Yeah. In Spanish. Never been on Reddit before I made this offer. Really? Uh, yeah, before I first made the offer in like March 2015. Uh, but I found the ex-Mormon subreddit. I had at the time the biggest, fattest cat that loved to sit on my desk. And uh, <laughs> Chubbs Gato. That's, that's how we got there. Where'd you learn Spanish? Uh, my parents put me in Spanish immersion in elementary school. Oh, fun. Yeah. Okay. So... So you you put out the shingle, the re Mormon resignation shingle. Yep. And what happened? It just it went out. Of, it was out of control. There was so many people, uh, and then there there was the people offering that like wanted to keep it going. They wanted me to keep it going. Um, I don't think this is a service that like a you know you can hire an attorney probably and might charge you five hundred dollars to prepare a letter and send it for you. But there's no one else that was willing to just do this for free, send it to the church and. And do it. So I had people, like I said, web developers contacting me. Let's make this easier. Let's <laughs> let's find a way for you to do more of these. Help as many people as possible. And it just it just went from there. So why, like, I could see you doing it as a personal favor for a few friends here and there. Yeah. Why, why continue when it starts to get to the hundreds and thousands? You've got a day job. You have a family, right? Yeah. What was it? What was it that made you feel passionate enough to say, "I'm taking this on at a at a large scale"? Honestly, it was it was the frog in the boiling water. They started me cold, and now it's hot. But it's uh, what it's, do you mean? Uh, they put me in the pot of water, and they turned up the heat. Who did? <laughs> Everyone, all of you, uh, asking me to do this for you. Okay. Uh, and it, it it never was anything. I never wanted to do 90. I never thought 90,000 was even possible. Um, but it just, people needed it. I was there. Uh, everyone kept making it easier, streamlining the process for me, uh, encouraging me, giving me donations, offering to volunteer. It just, it was something that I just kept on doing. Uh, and I'm proud of it and I'm glad it's something I'm doing, but I'm also realizing that people need uh, like I said, they need more than just to put an attorney between them and the church. It's, it's about taking a next step sure. and leaving Mormonism here, not just on paper. So how did the numbers grow from 2015 until now, 2021? At first it was every time there was a bad talk at general conference. Uh, I'm not a Mormon spectator. Uh, I guess is maybe I, I don't follow it. I'm not on the ex-Mormon subreddit. I'll I'll go on when I put an update up, but I'm not I'm not there looking at memes or seeing what the news is. Uh, honestly, John, I didn't know who you were until a couple of years ago. So it's like, um, and so I get these phone calls from people like, "Hey, have you been on John Delin's podcast yet?" And I'm like, "Well, who's John Delin? <laughs> number one, uh, and that's but, probably healthy. That's probably healthy. That you don't if, know who I am. I feel, <laughs> yeah, it feels great to not like. I'm upset about this thing that they said in general conference. Like, oh, I'll have to look that up. <laughs> uh, that feels better than also being upset, right? Um, but it's a it's a process, of course. Uh, and like I said, I don't think I fully graduated from that process until I was five years ago, 31, yeah. 32 years old." So, uh, so it just starts snowballing. Yep. And, uh, w what have the numbers been like, like over time? How do you describe the, the growth or the decline or, or whatever? So, like I said, I'll get, uh, I used to get on when I was the one primarily, uh, checking the page, um, and be like, oh man, what happened this weekend? <laughs> what did Elder Oaks say this weekend? And so, it, a low, tell us what a low and, an, and a high number would be. I probably get at least ten a day. Okay. Uh, Still? And, oh yeah. Uh, and I, I, you know, a couple thousand in a weekend. A Sometimes general, you'd get a couple thousand. A general conference weekend. Wow. Yeah. So it ebbs and flows <laughs> and, and the church and their attorneys see that ebb and flow as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're very aware of it. Yeah. Um, and we'll see when they start falling behind, when they get behind about a couple thousand, uh, on confirming the names, that's when a new rule gets imposed. 
That's when uh, I get an email that's like, this is too strenuous on our, too taxing on our resources. We need to find an easier way. So let's talk about that process. So the, the church's law firm is well known as Curtin and McConkie, but, but there was a point where the, the church just had a, like a, a place you could write and resign to just at church headquarters. Which I still think you can if you don't use me. Um, so uh, membership records is where I used to send everything. Uh, 50 East North Temple, room 250. I so think you used to send the letters there? Directly to the church. And when, why did you change from that? I was notified by Daniel McConkie that he was now the representative of the Mormon church. And just as I am the, the representative for my clients, they're not allowed to contact them. I am now no longer allowed to contact Why do you the think church. they did that? Um, That's weird. I guess. Uh it, it, it's their it's their out so that they can have an excuse. Now Daniel McConkie can say, "Oh, this isn't in order here. This item or this thing. Uh, oh, we're getting a lot of fraud. We need notarized records." Um, and honestly, I would call them. I would call the membership records, and I would say, "Hey, this is Mark Noggle. Um, I am an attorney, and I submitted a request for so and so, and we're following up on that. I never received a confirmation." And they would sit silent, not say anything. I'd say, hello, are you still there? Like, I'm here. Like, well, can you answer my question? <laughs> um, no, I cannot. Like, do you have a supervisor I can talk to? I'd get transferred to a supervisor. Same thing. Uh, I mean, all I can assume is that I'm the devil incarnate to them. Mm. And they were unwilling to just even communicate with me. Was Was part of it? Maybe trying to protect member confidentiality because they probably don't want to talk about, you know, how do they know it's you? How do they know it's not somebody else? They could have told me that, right? They could have said, well, I'm sorry, that's a confidential record and you need to submit documentation. You're, you're their attorney. Yeah. What I had, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, so that could have been it, but I doubt it. Okay. And then they got to the point with me calling. I mean, my clients are wanting out. They want their confirmation letter. They're calling me. So what choice do I have but to call them and say, hey, this is what we're doing. This is what we're waiting for. Um, and they got to the point where like, you know what? You need to talk to our attorneys. And that's kind of where we started down this path of now an now their attorneys are involved. Okay. So at some point you switched from working with the church membership records to Curtin and McConkie. Talk our listeners through kind of the increasing barriers that they've put up to make it harder and harder. So for, well, well, when things were most streamlined, mm -hmm. what was the velocity of processing that you were experiencing? 50 a day. They were processing 50 a day. Well, I was processing 50 a day okay. and they would confirm them like once a month, they'd mail me a stack of confirmation letters. So how many would you get in a month? 400, 500. Okay. <laughs> in a stack. I mean, I have a storage unit with stacks of confirmation letters. Really? Yeah. You keep them in a storage unit? Yeah, for now. Yep. Okay. Um, so, yeah, they, they were processing them. I'd get them in the mail. Everything was, I would have to scan them in, manually transfer them, each one to the profile or email it back to the client. So it was actually taking a lot of my time. Did you hire people to help? Any I, staff? Or? I, I always had lots of volunteers. But I had the same problem with confidentiality is like, you know, I really appreciate that I have all these people want to help me, but I can't just find some, I, whoever, you know, I'm just relying on people to reach out to me. So I can't just be sending these letters off to someone's house. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, that's very sensitive, confidential information. And I, so I just never did it. Okay. So you were always processing them yourself? Uh, yes. I now have uh, some help from some people that I trust and that are understand the attorney-client relationship, um, but that took a while to get there. Okay. Okay, so you were at, at some high point processing 500-ish a month, Yeah. Um, which would be, you know, 6,000 a year. What's the most you ever processed in a year? Do you know? I don't. Uh, I could probably find out, but I would guess it was early on. I think it was like 15,000 or something in that yeah. first year. Um, but maybe not. I, I, it, but I mean, if you're up to, 90. if you're up to 90,000 submitted yeah. and you've been doing it since 2015. 
I have not kept good stats, but I would say, yeah, uh, there, there were some times, there were some back-to-back general conferences there, um, you know, spring and fall that just kind of, uh, it could have been 20, 25,000 in a year. Yeah. So. Yeah. Any big events that, that really triggered excommunications that, that come to mind? Well, obviously how this whole thing started was the was LGBTQ the November. November handbook release. Um, there would be individual talks. Certain talks. Elder yeah. Oaks or Packer gives a talk. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Uh, I think when the, the hundred billion, the hundred billion leak came out that they're holding a hundred uh, billion dollars in. The uh, Ensign Peak yeah. leak where the church has over $120 billion of cash and stocks invested that they're not spending on charitable purposes. Right. Yeah, I would expect that to be a problem. So, but again, I'm so separated from it, from Mormon news. Yeah. um, That I, I don't know. And then when the Salt Lake Tribune writes an article, you know, like tell us about your membership numbers, uh, Ryan, the the web developer, uh, he's the one that's send them all that documentation. I'm not part of that in in any way, except to make sure there's no confidential information. Oh, because sometimes I I, I saw in your, on your report that sometimes you give stats to the Salt Lake Tribune because the church, any, do you have any theories on why the church doesn't just publish annually the number of resignations, make that information public? Well, that's just, why would anyone leave the church, John? <laughs> yeah. I, I, mean, I guess they don't want, I would guess they don't want the church to be perceived as a sinking ship where sure. so many people are leaving. And so they just don't make, they don't make resignations public you can kind of figure it out by calculations each year, yeah. but they don't make uh, activity rates public. Right. Uh, they only talk about growth and baptisms and total total number of members. The one year I went to seminary, the only thing I remember is we watched a video where the earth was in, floating in space and then a giant stone rolled across the face of the earth. And that was the Mormon church. The gospel. Like, like, what is yeah, that? Yeah. So, I mean, if that's your mentality and – it's actually the other way around. Everyone's leaving. That's it's bad PR, I guess. Yeah. 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 It sounds like, you know, on average 10, 10 ish thousand, you've been processing around 10 ish thousand a year. Yeah, sure. Some for, more, some less. Yeah. yeah. For six years or so. Right. Yeah. 12 or 13,000 actually, if you're getting to yeah. 90, but yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, so talk about the barriers, how the how the Curtin McConkey just started making it harder for you, and and why. So first thing is, I get a letter from Curtin McConkey that says, "You are no, we are now representing the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, and you should no longer send membership requests to them directly. They should everything will come through my office." Um, I think we scheduled a phone call. I talked to Daniel McConkey and said, Hey, uh, I'm happy to do this. Where do you want me to send it? What's your address? It's like, well, just email it all over to me. So we started emailing Dan McConkey, each one of these resignations, which resulted in, you know, 12 to 13,000 emails in Dan McConkey's inbox every year. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. That's not fun. If yeah. you're Dan McConkey. And do you know how he's related to Oscar or any of the McConkeys? I think he's one of the brothers. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he gets spammed and. Yeah. I mean, call it spam. I asked him where he wanted it. Yeah. I, uh, how do you want me to deliver this to you? Yeah. Sir, I'd be pleased to get this to you. Yeah. Um, so start sending those over and they just fall behind. Hmm. They just, I mean, I don't know if they didn't set up his forward correctly. I mean, what what process does he need to do? I don't know to check these before they go to the church. It's basically you're just creating a barrier, right? You're just creating the next step. Okay, it has to go through church headquarters, and that's a little bit of an excuse, right? That's an extra step. Church attorneys have to review it before it goes to church headquarters, and then it has to come back to church attorneys, and then back to me. So, at that point, I believe they stopped uh, issuing individual letters. Uh, which people didn't like. They loved getting their letters that uh, with churches. They're not. They're no longer issuing letters. They will not issue a letter. What? They just started sending me a spreadsheet of every name they removed, and in PDF printed format, not like 
something that I could read, you know, like that my computer could read, that we could design a so uh, software. Okay, so this is, believe it or not, this is news to me because I don't always follow everything closely, but sure. it's almost like an ex-Mormon ritual. It became an ex-Mormon ritual for you to post, sometimes with your name redacted or the name's redacted, but for you to post your your uh, confirmation of your of your removal from the records. And I still see those, I believe, and so I, this is the first I've heard that the church doesn't actually send those letters anymore. Uh, yeah, they stopped doing that. I think that was three years ago, basically whenever Curtin and Conkey got involved. Huh. And they know that. They know people love getting those letters. Yeah. Uh, and it was, it was public. It was getting posted all the time. It was sort of a symbol of pride of like, I accomplished something. I'm very, you know, it was celebratory. And at first I'm like, oh, that's tacky. And then I'm like, wait a minute. It's like a declaration of independence. Yeah. It's an act of empowerment right. and people were really proud of it. So wow, they stopped those letters. I actually didn't know that. Yeah. It was one of the first things Curtin McConkie implemented. So they would send me back a spreadsheet and we'd have to read through this terribly saved spreadsheet with tiny, as small a print, I think, as they thought they could get away with and confirm each name that way. Okay. Uh, so I just kept trudging on. We. Uh, so how would you notify people when the resignation? I'd send them an email. You'd send them an email. Yeah, I'd send them an email and say, hey, yeah, we they don't give us letters anymore, but your names, they told us your name's been removed. If you ever receive contact or find out your name's on the records, let me know. How would you even know if they actually made any changes? Uh, we never have known if they've actually made any changes. Hmm. That's so weird. We're never going to know because there's no way they'll allow any lawsuit to go to a discovery phase where they start turning over their membership records. Right, right. Yeah. And the only thing, so then how do you know, I guess, does your correspondence with them, and I, I think it does, contain some type of language saying do not contact? Absolutely. Absolutely. And do you think, I mean, it, I would think it'd be in the church's interest to follow that or else are there potential legal repercussions? Yes, uh, absolutely. I mean, once you've asked someone not to harass you, if I ask you not to harass me, John, and you start calling my house and talking to my family and doing stuff like that. Even I, if it's bringing cookies, yeah. do, do, does that, can that be considered harassment? It could be. Now there's legal standards and there's, you know, what we all else, what we consider to be harassment. So what we're coming down to is whether if in a church capacity, these people, but I mean, it's almost impossible for them to not be acting in a church capacity. Um, but I just tell my clients here, everybody gets, you know, they get one strike if they call you, email you, bring you cookies, and you tell them, I'm represented by attorney, I don't want to talk to you again, and they still start showing up, then we're going to have a problem. But honestly, it usually ends uh, right after right after they tell them that. And I say, and we're going to start documenting this a, a little bit in a little bit more detail now that we're not receiving any confirmations back. And there is a way for a member to know if, if they, you know, um, if their names have been removed, I would guess. I, I would guess at a minimum, their their name no longer their name no longer shows up in LDS tools. And 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 you're saying that the church doesn't send the members a letter either, telling them that their name has been removed. No, and that would technically be a violation of of the my attorney uh, representation. Oh, so they should not be contacting them in any way. Oh. And those letters, like I said, they used to contain a pamphlet and threats about you. Going to hell. Yeah. So, um, what was your question? I'm sorry. So, did your did your letters did your communication with the church say please, please respond with a letter confirming that that their names have been removed? Yes. And they just refused to. They just stopped doing it. Yeah. But, I mean, there's no law or statute or case law that says if one attorney asks an organization for something, they have to do it. Yeah. Yeah, when I appealed my excommunication, I didn't appeal it because I, um, you know, really wanted them necessarily to keep me on the records, but I wanted validation that my excommunication was endorsed by the by the okay. first presidency, and I asked for a letter, and my stake president wouldn't give me one. He he said he received a letter, but that he wouldn't give me a copy of it. So sure, that that well, you might have put it on Reddit. Yeah. And then everyone would have seen how ridiculous it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
So that's kind of, it's a little bit slimy and creepy, I think. Just <laughs> stand up. If you're going to do something, stand up and do it, right? You would think so. Okay. Okay, so the letter stopped coming. They made right. You know. So the letter stopped coming. We get only spreadsheets. Uh, we we keep rolling. We actually quit Mormon. We made a little certificate that says quitmormon.com. Uh, attorneys at Curtin and McConkie, church attorneys have confirmed that you, John DeLynn, uh, your name has been removed from the records of the church. People like that, so. and that's what people are posting. Maybe. Okay. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, maybe they might be posting that. But also, they might not have gone through me. They might have actually got a letter. Mm -hmm. My understanding is you'll still get a letter if you just deal with them directly. Okay. Uh, or maybe even have another attorney do it. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah. they We provide a little certificate. People like it. You know, it's something to give people to say, like, hey, this is done. Um, and we keep rolling. I'd say, you know, they fall behind again, maybe four or 5,000. Um, uh, an important thing I need to know is before we went to, before this went to Curtin McConkie, before this was just going directly to the church, I did have one case where a guy got drunk in Toronto, Canada, and submitted a resignation on Quit Mormon for Thomas S. Monson. Hmm. And this was like the week of his death. And, uh, like the next morning he, and I, I didn't catch it. I, I clicked it through. Uh, and the next morning he emails me and he's like, I'm really sorry. I made a huge mistake. Uh, you know, what do I do? I'm like, well, you screwed me number one, but it's okay. I'll just email the church. Let them know that that one was, you know, we found out that one's fraudulent and there you go. Um, and so we notified them right away. Um, and that has been the thing they've, from since then, they have always, anytime they communicate with me, they tell me how my submissions are fraudulent and that my submissions are, need to be triple checked because, you know, people are having their sacred covenants removed from church records without permission and all of this stuff. I don't, I never got a confirmation letter for Thomas S. Monson. Um, I don't think that they actually deleted his, and. and are you aware of anyone ever having a resignation submitted that they didn't want submitted. In other words, people get removed, their names removed from the records of the church when they didn't want it. No. Okay. Not in that way, but I do have people who will get drunk on a Saturday night and say to hell with grandma. And when they would submit a resignation, they would get clicked through. And then on the next Sunday, The bishop comes up and says, "Hey, you resigned from the church." I'm like, "I didn't. I did not do that, oh, right?" And then we right. head down this path of yeah. so we've had quite a few of those. Okay, um, and people get cold feet. Oh yeah, absolutely. And the process was so easy; it really was. Uh, you could just go on, get it, sign it, and you could be out of the church records. Yeah, uh, off of God's paperwork or whatever it is that you know that they're keeping. So. Um, yeah. And that was a problem. And so they said, okay, here we go. Uh, church attorneys are involved. You gotta, you gotta submit ID now. Right. Or at least say that you reviewed ID, accept ID for each of these resignations. So we start doing that. Um, they fall behind 5,000, 6,000. I'm reaching out. Hey, what's going on? We've submitted 6,000 to you since this date. I haven't heard anything back takes a few weeks and they say, um, looks like because of the fraud that you, you know, well, you know, their, their standard language, fraud and duplicates and whatever it is, uh, this isn't working. We can't do the uh, IDs anymore. We've got to have a notarized document. So, I mean, what can we do? Let's just get notarized documents from now on. Um, if people really want to get out of the, you know, get their name off the records and go through these steps, they'll do it. And people did. <laughs> I had volunteers offering to notarize documents. I, you know, I kind of said in my Reddit post, hey, go to your notary and show them how ridiculous it is to leave this this church. And by the way, any Wells, any Wells Fargo bank, as an example, has a notary public that you can just walk into, sit down with them, and they'll you don't even have to bank at that bank. Correct. And they'll... Uh, Most credit unions as well. Yeah. So local banks are often just super easy, cheap ways. Absolutely. Um, to, to get a document notarized. So we carry on notarized documents now. <laughs> yeah. Still only getting spreadsheets back. Um, in the meantime, um, 
yeah, everything's going smoothly. Now identity is verified by a third party. So the frauds and duplicates and all this stuff that you're claiming, uh, it's, I don't know what else, you know, what other steps do you want? You want a blood sample or fingerprints or how you, <laughs> DNA, how you guys yeah. want this done? Um, they just stop responding. They say, they don't say anything. I email them. I call them. I try to get through them. I say, okay, it doesn't sound like you're even representing the church anymore. Um, so I email them and say, Hey, just so you know, I'm assuming that you don't represent the church anymore since I haven't heard from you in five weeks. Uh, I get an email the next morning that says, no, we still definitely represent the church, but we need to figure out a way to do this, you know, a better way that, to do this together. So it's convenient for you and your clients and the church. Uh, we are still working on whatever resolution that is. Uh, but with that in mind, that's why I've kind of just taken on, you know what, this is BS. We don't need to do this anymore. We don't need to sit and wait for them. We don't need to try and, you know, beg them to give us what we need, what we want. What we really want is for you to leave us alone. That's what my clients want. Stop contacting them, get their names off the records. If you take their names off the records, at least at the local level, you'll st they'll stop getting the contact. So we are now, when we submit these requests, we're saying, hey, Kurt and McConkie, LDS Church, you have five business days uh, to honor my client's requests. So this is the latest. This is what we're doing now. When, when did when did you change and kind of start that that new process of, of giving? You say you you say you're giving them five days. Yep. To again to what? To stop cont contacting my clients and get their names off the records. And is the idea there that you're basically just. Uh, you're basically trying to put a stop to their constant delays yeah. and you're trying to start a clock ticking where there's some liability if people get harassed. Correct. Is that right? Potential actionable harassment. You know, if you, people start showing up after that and they've been warned, then this is a civil matter now. This becomes. And yeah, when did that sure. start where you started that new approach? Uh, in two weeks ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so you're telling people that, um, are people still doing the notary public stuff with you? Yeah. So we're still going to submit notarized letters for now. Uh, in the future, uh, we may provide an option like uh, quit Mormon light, perhaps. If you don't want to go through the notary process, uh, we'll notify them of your desire to no longer be contacted, but they may not remove your name from the records without confirmation of your identity, which I guess, fair enough. Um, you know, the last thing we want to do is Know, take away someone's sacred ordinances by, you know, deletion in the system or whatever, mm -hmm. whatever they do. I mean, we, we know for a fact that the reason I know for a fact that they don't actually completely remove your name from the records is because they're telling me I'm submitting duplicate requests, right? right? Someone submitted it a year right. ago. We never yeah. heard a confirmation. Then I send it again and they say, well, this is a duplicate. Well, how can it be a duplicate if I never received a confirmation and you actually removed the person's <laughs> name from the record? That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> so we know it's still there somewhere. Yeah. No, there's just a big database of everyone who's ever been confirmed or baptized. Right. And there's a field in the record where they say current member or not. Correct. Or you know, excommunicated or not or whatever. And the thing with the duplicates is... I, I emailed them. I said, okay, how do you want me to handle requests where you have not confirmed that the name has been removed, but we've asked you to re remove that name? They said, you'll have to send them again, <laughs> which by definition is a duplicate. Uh, but then when I send them duplicates- They complain and say you're can, sending duplicates. And I, I believe that they think uh, that by confirming duplicates, they're admitting that they still have the name on the records uh, and haven't removed it. Hmm. Weird. Weird. So do you think there, do you have, do you suspect that there's a case where if somebody submitted the letter five days go by and then they start getting love bombed, do you think there's a case like the, for harassment and even for damages, psychological damages or whatever? Potentially. And that's kind of what we're building towards, right? Like we'll see, but at least we're setting this, this, this line in the sand. Okay. You're not going to confirm our resignations. We better not be harassing my clients and you better not have their name on the, the local Lord local ward list at least.
Take them out of LDS tools, basically. Yeah, and LDS tools is a different story. And I don't know anything about LDS tools, but my understanding is, is that your name, when you try to log in, it will say you've asked to be removed from the records or something like that, but your name will still be there. But you can change that name to anything that you'd like. You can change it up to 1234. You can change it to cesletter.com. Um, and so that's what I advise people to do there. Um, <laughs> to do what? <laughs> just change it to something else. Just change it to... I'm not a member anymore instead of John Dillon. In LDS Tools? Yeah. And all the other members of the ward and stake will see that name change? Yeah, I guess. I don't know how LDS <laughs> Tools works, but that's my understanding is that is that if your name's still in there, it's 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 changeable. You can just make it into something else. Can you imagine if members started uh, inactive or ex-members who are still on the rolls all changed – their names to mormonstories.org or cesletter.org. Can you imagine? I mean, I imagine, I, I know that at least with transgender people, yeah. they want to be able to be called by by not their legal name or not the name that not they necessarily, yeah. their dead name, uh, but, but by whatever current name they have. So I, I'm glad if they're providing that service for transgender or non, non-binary individuals. But that that is an interesting Trojan horse for people that want to. If you start doing that, there will be changes to LDS tools pretty quickly. For sure, sure. for sure. And that's not, I'm mixed about that because I don't want to mess it up for transgender Mormons. Sure. Or non-binary Mormons. But at the same time, like freaking stop making this so hard. (laughs) So you're saying there may be, you know, in the future, some lawsuits to sue the church for harassment. Sure. And there are reasonable steps that we have to take, right? We can't just be like, oh, you dropped off cookies, lawsuit, right? The damages there are going to be minimal. Uh, convincing a Utah state court uh, <laughs> that, you know, judge who is most likely a white LDS man that this is actionable is going to be tough. So what we have to do is actually build, build cases of like constant harassment. Uh, so what I tell my clients is first, give them my name, my phone number, my email address, uh, and say, I'm represented by an attorney. If you want to contact me again, you need to contact him. Then if you do receive contact after that, you let me know. And we start, we document it as best we can and start building cases that way. It's, it's so unfortunate. And and I've been through this because, you know, when, when I got excommunicated and then Margie resigned, our kids were all still in their, you know, North Logan community you don't want to be harsh with the leadership or else like everybody doesn't want to talk to your kid and they get ostracized and they lose all their friends and people gossip. Yep. So, but, but if you don't be direct and firm, then they're always making your kids feel like their parents are losers or like they're a project or they, you know, Which they're gonna it's do weird. Anyways. It's yeah. But it's weird because like, Sometimes they drop off a picture of Jesus or a thing of cookies, and that seems fine, right? Except, what if you don't believe in Jesus? What if what if you those cookies feel like manipulation or pressure, like you're not good enough? Or, you know, what, what if what if it starts to make a kid feel like they're uh, inferior or less than or a problem? Like we're in this weird world where, yeah, that doesn't seem so bad, but it it really can feel intimidating and sad and hard, especially for a kid, you know, like there's something wrong with them. As a 12 year old, we would, we called them the men in black. When the, when the bishopric would walk down our driveway to our house, we would hide, you know, turn off all the lights, close the blinds and hide Yeah, because it was, it's just, oh my God, I don't want to sit here and hear your monotone voice for 45 minutes about whatever. And, And the whole, we love you. And we'd really love to see you back. It's, it's condescending. I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell a coworker I, I'd really love to see you at church. Like I wouldn't move to Maryland and tell some neighbor that, why aren't you right. at church? <laughs> like it, it, it really, it kind of, it's weird because it seems so nice, but it, it really is a problem. Yeah, it absolutely is a problem. Yeah. And I don't think it's a problem that you can solve just by having a lawyer. Right. Uh, yeah. It is something that you're going to have to learn to get past in your life and deal with. Uh, regardless of whether I'm representing you or you have a compound uh, where they can't get in. 
Uh, it's something that, and that's kind of why we're trying to transition to actually helping people leave this thing uh, and learning how to deal with those circumstances rather than, uh, you know, I can't file 90,000 lawsuits, John. It's just not yeah. going to be possible. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, and I'm, there are attorneys who've offered to help me, uh, but I don't know that they even can uh, take on as much as, as needs to be, as honestly probably needs to be done in order to yeah. put everyone in line. Okay, so I have a bunch of wonderful questions from my audience that I'm going to just kind of go down the line. Hopefully I, there aren't too many repeats here. I've tried to kind of uh, highlight the ones that aren't repeats. Okay. And can we just go into a firing round of questions? Let's go. Okay, so one question that I've always had. So when my wife resigned, she got a confirmation back within – she just resigned to the bishop. Mm -hmm. She found some verbiage on the internet – Resigned, resigned to the bishop through email. He passed up to the state president, came back down. The email said, I don't ever want to be contacted again. Uh, I, I'm waiving all, you know, waiving all rights. I don't want any threatening, you know, responses after this. Please confirm as soon as this is done. I don't, you know, et cetera. So all the, all the kind of verbiage, all the do not contacts, all the kind of harassment language, but then just kind of take me off the rolls of the records. And she got a confirmation back within a week or two. Awesome. So it was super fast. It was super efficient. And she's never been harassed. Now, I don't know how much that was just them eager to get my wife off the records because she's my wife and we're viewed as dangerous. But that always made me wonder why, why is there a need for you or quit Mormon? If that process was so fast, do you, do you know whether that direct process is still fast and efficient for people? Do you know? We, uh, from what I hear back from people is that can happen or it might not. Um, okay. it, it seems to depend on your bishop and your stake president Okay. on how reasonable of people they are really. Okay. Uh, and, you know, if they've seen this coming, right. Wife of John DeLynn, or if this is like out of the blue and you're uh, the boy scout leader, uh, you can be a different. So I don't discourage people from doing that. Uh, if you have the courage and the, you know, the, you want to do it and get it off, off the records and try to go through your bishop, I'd say, yes, do that. That's going to be the quickest route to, to getting a confirmation letter. And you can still say, I, I, I retained an attorney. And if you keep reaching out to me or my children, I'll consider this harassment. Sure. You can still include all that language in the email to your bishop or stake president. Absolutely. And, and it's, I guess it's in theoretically legally binding. Uh, only things that are legally binding is what a court says is legally. Binding. Yeah. And right. we don't know what a court's going to say. Okay. About this. But I mean, I would think the church would take that seriously. You would think so. Yeah. Uh, it took my family with that same language I, 25 years ago, but it took us six months to get our letter back. Okay. So that, uh, and, yeah. and that's not an uncommon experience. Yeah. So, but again, I don't discourage anyone from doing that. But if you are, uh, if you've tried that route and you're getting contact and your okay. bishop's showing up, you? And then yeah. come on over. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. But I just want to, it's not to discourage people nope. going to you. It's just to let people know if you're frustrated with the timing and you really want it done, sometimes the direct route is, can't, maybe it will be the fastest. And what I, what I have happened is, so they go through me, right? We send it out. Uh, I never oh, hear right, anything right. back. Yeah. And then the client is like, okay, I'm going to take care of this myself. I'm tired yeah. of this. And they'll contact the church and be like, and they'll say, oh, well, you're represented by an attorney. We can't talk to you. <laughs> so you did receive the letter. Oh, That's yeah. great. Good to know. Uh, so shady. Okay. Next question. Um, can parents resign on behalf of their children, minors? And if so, what are the rules? Uh, you know, what does it take for the church to take that seriously? Uh, it's the same process. And our, our form actually provides a uh, signature for both parents. So they've decided that they'll only honor both parents signing if the child's under 18. Uh, or you have to have some documentation that you have the legal right to make religious decisions, which is in most divorce decrees, um, if you have that. Uh, once the child's over 18, of course, you can't just resign for another legal person. So uh, you have to have your 18-year-old do it themselves if they want to. Okay. But parents are enough. Um, Absolutely. To, to get their kids off the records, whether they've been 
just confirmed or baptized as well. Correct. Okay. And that's binding for, for life as far as you know? As far as I know. Okay. This is probably the biggest question I received. There's a lot of people that want to resign, but they don't want their parents or their grandparents or their siblings to know. They don't want to break grandma's heart or break mom and dad's heart, or they don't want to get disowned from an inheritance. That inheritance, or, yeah. What, what's that? <laughs> I was going to say inheritance, but you got that. That happens. <laughs> yeah. There's oh, yeah, of, absolutely. Yeah. Um, or they, you know, or they just are private, whatever it is. Yeah. So d does, if somebody resigns either by themselves or through you, are there ways for their extended family to be notified? And well, that's the first part of the question. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, I always tell people, if you are not ready for everyone to know about this, <laughs> don't do it. How does the church generally notify extended family? Do you, do you know how they do that? It's the bishop, like you said. Yeah, it's the bishop or the Relief Society president or whoever. Uh, you know, oh, I'm worried about, I'm worried about Janine down the street. And then it just goes from there. But like, let's say hey, I'm from Southern California and yeah. I'm here in Utah and I resign and my parents are back in Southern California. They're not all part of this immediate gossip mill. Are there other ways that you're aware of? Uh, as far as I know, like genealogy records and things like that are affected that are controlled by the church. Uh, also tithing settlement. Right. Uh, Talk about that. Uh, as far as I know, uh, tithing settlement statements have your immediate family members on them. Uh, and so if your name's removed, it suddenly might not appear on the tithing settlement. Yeah. So grandma and grandpa or mom and dad uh, show up to tithing settlement and it lists their kids at the bottom yep. when they're paying their money and some names are missing. And that's, that's the trigger. You, you've heard that. That's you've the red flag. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And that's just kind of sad and awful. Okay. But that, you know, the church would say, well, we're respecting your wishes and deleting your name from everything that you asked. Right. Right. And so this is all baked in. That's part of being part of this crazy thing that we're all mixed up in is that it's, it's baked in for you to not want to leave. Uh, and to take these steps is, is honestly courageous. When I see a person submitting a resignation at 83 years old, like I want to go find them and give them a hug. Not right now. That's dangerous. But otherwise it's like amazing. Good for you. 83 years old and you're able to think this through and go, wow, maybe this isn't for me anymore. What are the main reasons people give you for wanting? I mean, there, there's an argument that often is advanced, which is like, hey, it's all made up anyway. It's just a dumb database. Church isn't true. Silly so, little club, I call it sometimes. What's that? Silly little club. Yeah, so it's like some would say, why even bother to resign? Others would say it's just a tweak in a, tweak in a database. Yeah. Why? What are the main reasons you hear from people as to why they want to resign? The reason I do this is because, uh, and I keep doing it, is because I, wanna, I want to help people have that final, like it is a moment in your life when you click, even you just click that button, to say, submit, I don't want to be part of this anymore. I think that's a mm, mental release. Like a, You're breaking down a barrier mm. that allows you to take those next steps into the rest of your life. So kind of an act, of, like we said before, like an act of empowerment, of self-empowerment, of liberation from something that's been hurting you, an act of defiance, an act of separation, Absolutely. cutting the ties. And I find that people go through, almost after they do it, some people, uh, go through the five stages of grief. It's right. a breakup. Yeah. It's a, it's a loss. You potentially losing your community, right? You're potentially losing your job. Uh, it's, it is a major step in people's lives. Uh, and for me, honestly, it's a lot of responsibility. Uh, and I, I want to help as many people make that mental step as possible. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, another justification I often hear is I don't want them to be able to count me anymore. And so it's this idea of the church boasts 16 million. They want, one of the reasons they don't, they keep someone on the records until long after they're, they're dead. Mm -hmm. Potentially they don't really, maybe don't proactively try and scrub the records to find who's left. And they don't share any of the statistics is because the church wants to continue the perception that they're strong and growing. And so by resigning people in theory, uh, 
they sort of say, this is my way to reduce the number by at least one mm -hmm. and not allow them to count me in their totals. Is that something you also hear? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and honestly, I think that's one of the most threatening things about quitmormon.com uh, for the church uh, is that we, we'll, we're tallying it up. Yeah. We're saying, here's how many, here's how many we're doing. Here's how many people are resigning per week. I think we still have a Twitter handle that does that. I'm not sure, but, uh, I'm pretty sure we're, we're still out there. And so when we get those confirmations back and we used to get, you know, get those confirmations back and people are posting on the internet, that's breeding more dissent, right? I want one of those letters. Yeah. I want to get my name off the records. So, uh, I have no emotional tie to holding on to quitmormon.com. If quitmormon.com disappeared tomorrow because it no longer was needed, that would probably be my ultimate goal. Mm-hmm. I, I wish that this wasn't something that. So, if the church would streamline the process, you would you would stop. Absolutely, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you could go yeah. on LDS Tools and click a button, and Mark Noggle was not necessary at any point in this step, I can find something else to do with my extra time. <laughs> <laughs> but for now, you're still issuing the statements when when you get the confirmation. Yes. Okay. Um. All right. Uh, other questions from our awesome listeners. Uh, my, Oh, someone asks, Mark, if my wife and I both resign, do we also have to ask for our kids to be removed? That's a slightly different tweak on the question. You should. You should. Uh, we used, they used to do two things. They would say, your whole family has resigned. Here's your one letter for the family. They used to send one for each member of the family. Uh, but just so it's clear, there's no questions, you should do the children as well in their own separate requests. And you're not sure if people resign directly without invoking a lawyer, if those letters are still being issued? Uh, I don't know for sure, but I hear that they are. Okay. So if you do want, and again, this isn't to disincent people from going to you, but if people do want their own letter, yeah. then they may be best uh, advised to just go directly to your bishop Absolutely. And you can still say, don't, I don't want you to tell other people. Uh, I don't want you to harass me. I want you to keep this in total confidentiality. I don't want, and of course, you know, whether that's binding or not is a different question, <laughs> but if you want your own letters, maybe go direct. Yeah. And what we're going to do too, is, uh, we are considering putting like a self-report resignation. So if you've resigned and you want your numbers counted, if you're doing this so that your number can be counted on quitmormon.com, Maybe you can go through your bishop if they're going to be cool and let you do it. And then you can self-report your resignation on Quit Mormon and we'll add one to the total. And you haven't done that yet? Not yet. Okay, so that so let's do that. If you do resign, how do they... How do they... So we'll probably put a tool or a okay, button you'll put a tool on the there, website. But, but, but if you want to email me, you can. Email me, you can just keep a little tally. That's yeah, a lot. What's a lot of pain, dude? What a pain. Yeah. It's what, it's, like I said, it just happens. People want it, yeah. we do it. It's an important service. I, yeah, we'll get to that in a second. Okay. My dear friend, Lila Tuller, um, I, f I, uh, oh, so one, one person asks, what is the average turnaround time for getting resignations processed today? So what's your backlog? I know you've already answered this, but ask, answer it again. What's the backlog? And if someone signs up today, what do you anticipate the turnaround is? There will be no turnaround. I, I anticipate in the future that the church has just stopped. Yeah, we're going, we're, that's why we're saying, Hey church, you don't have the power anymore. We have the power. Five days, and if we hear from you, then we're gonna have we're gonna have to be contact. Curtin McConkie is gonna start getting emails about contact. Are you saying you think they've just stopped processing resignations now? I think they're processing them, but they're they're done notifying me. It seems like, but I'm gonna be meeting with their attorneys actually this week, uh, and I'll I can, you're meeting with who? Uh, Dan McConkie this week. Oh really? What yeah. what what's the impetus and what's the uh, the day after my Reddit post? I got a call from his assistant, very friendly lady who's generally not very nice to me, but she was very excited about having a meeting so we could figure this all out. What's, I mean, the church could solve this in like three hours. They've Less. got the best computer technology consultants on the planet. Yeah. Like it just feels silly that, that they're kind of delaying installing and shenanigans, right? It's ridiculous. <laughs> I'm, I'm just a guy. I'm one guy. I'm a nobody attorney. Like in their world, right? Curtin McConkie has 50 attorneys. To be the partner at Curtin McConkie, I'm sure his house in Park City is enormous. But like for some reason, my little website that sends them requests to remove names is 
a pain in their butt. Hmm. Yeah. Well, will you come back and let us know how that meeting goes and what yeah, happens in the meeting? I'm actually going to record the meeting with their consent. And uh, I've also, in that Reddit post, I said, I'm going to start just posting every all the communications I get from them so the world can see how ridiculous this is. Yeah. And that's what convinced me that they're monitoring the ex-Mormon subreddit. Of course they're. Immediately yeah. get a phone call. Well, I will share any audio you have with Kurt and McConkey. I'll share it on Mormon Stories because cool. I've got a... a Decent distribution for that. <laughs> awesome. All right. Um, so Lila, Lila Tuller, shout out to Lila. We love you, Lila. Um, she writes, I filed through Quit Mormon months ago and have heard nothing. Is this normal? Um, so what about the people, the 20 plus thousand of the yeah. backlog? What, what for them? This is the new normal. Um, I'm sorry, but you're probably not going to get a confirmation from the church. Has nothing to do with me or my efforts, but uh, they they're done giving those confirmations out. It seems. I mean, I might have more information for you later this week, but it seems like we're just gonna have to go this new route of saying, "Hey, uh, five business days. That's it." Okay. Stephanie asks, "Why is it that the church makes it so hard to remove records from kids that were only blessed?" I mean, that's probably speculation on your part. But. Absolutely specu speculation. They don't want to remove anybody's records, um, so uh, they want to be able to still reach out when that kid turns eight and say, "Why aren't you getting baptized?" Yeah. All right. Stephanie says, we used Quit Mormon to resign three years ago. It was so easy, and I really appreciate your service. I didn't realize how strong the language in this letter to our bishop was about no contact until he came over to tell us um, he had received our resignations. He seemed kind of terrified uh, to be at our house. He was very kind and thanked me for all my services over the years. I didn't leave because of the local leadership or members. I love them and they are my friends. It's the church higher ups who know it's a fraud who I have a problem with. I don't want my ward friends to feel unwelcome at my house. They've never bothered me. I guess I should have read it before. Um, yeah. So what would you, that's not really a question. It's just a statement. I guess it's kind of saying, how do we, how do we do this where you don't damage local relationships and at the same time, they respect your privacy because there's a lot of people that it's you're on the same soccer team or your kids yeah. are still friends and they're like, Oh my gosh, if, if my kid comes over to play with, with your kid now it's going to be, you know, considered harassment. Well, you use the word love bomb. Yeah. So we don't want love bombs. Yeah. We want respect. Yeah. Um, I, there's some people that love that their bishops terrified to come over to their house. Hmm. Um, so it's, I don't know. It's complex. And you kind of have to, again, decide that for yourself. Uh, and yes, please read things before you sign them. Um, but it's, my intention is not to ruin your personal relationships. Uh, my intention is to get them to stop contacting you and remove your name from the records. So if you feel like you have a better relationship with your bishop than I do, right? And then I can provide, then you need to talk to your bishop directly and get, re get resigned through him. Um, but if you don't want to see his face ever again, that's kind of what I'm for. Okay. I wonder if your site could provide options, both the resignation through you or the direct email and kind of like facilitate either process depending on people's preference. That is a suggestion that we've received yeah. and we will be implementing that. Okay. Awesome. Thanks. Douglas Stilgo, Nemo on YouTube. Shout out to Douglas. We love Douglas. He says, "Does do you believe, Mark Noggle, that your services should be necessary? Should a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or of any religion need an attorney to help them leave a church? Like I said, if I didn't have to exist and none of you knew my name, I would be completely fine with that. Yeah. All right. Melissa writes, I uh, filled out all the paperwork, submitted with the photo, driver's license, everything, never got any confirmation. How does Melissa know if it actually went through? The truth is, Melissa, we even if you received a confirmation from them, you would never know what's, you know, if it's a tweak in a database or what's actually been removed from their records. Um, but if you start receiving contact, uh, harassment, you find out your name's still on the records, please let me know immediately and 
we'll reach out and try to get that resolved. All right. Um, James writes, uh, have the recent changes to the handbook, which changed how the church approaches church discipline, excommunication, disfellowship, formal, informal probation, resignations, impacted how the church handles the resignations that you have submitted? To your knowledge, I guess I should have. No idea. I'm so sorry. Again, I'm, I am as separated from the updates to the Mormon church as yeah. I could possibly be. They don't keep you looped in. <laughs> they do not. Well, you can ask him in your meeting this week. <laughs> so Brian asks, uh, how has the church's adjustment regarding notarized requests impacted the volume of resignations in your process? Did that slow things down? At first it did, um, but people realized it's not that hard to get a notarized document. So we've uh, we've picked right back up where we left off. Okay. Bobby England writes, I hear families removing their names together, but often a child that was blessed but not baptized is left on the records. Is this just a miss on the church's end, or is it a different process? Seems to happen all too frequently to just be coincidence or overlooking. It's supposed to be the same process. Um, nobody's perfect. Uh, so all I can say is I don't know if the church is doing it on purpose or if it's policy. Um, there are clerical errors that they make that we catch. Uh, you know, they'll misspell people's names and things like that. So, um, yeah, it should be the same process. Um, Renee wants to know about the ins and outs of working with the infamous Kurt McConkie. Anything else you want to share about working with them? Nice people, jerks, like professional hacks. Like The first phone call I had with Dan McConkey, I think he thought we were going to good old boy it a little bit. And then when that wasn't, when that clearly was not going to happen, uh, he just stopped communicating with me. He'll either send me a letter or his, uh, his assistant will call me or email me. So I don't even hear from, I'm, this is the first time I'm going to hear his voice in three years hmm. uh, this week. Okay. So I, I think they rightfully think I'm a nobody uh, and um, that's fine. Uh, I'm okay with that. It's a little bit of disrespect, but what are you going to do? Do you worry that recording the conversation is going to make them cancel and not want to talk to you? If they listen to Mormon stories podcast, then uh, no, I, I mean, if they cancel because of that, that would be pretty wild. Yeah. Okay. Um, Jeff says he'd be interested in seeing some high level numbers to see what the trends are. Any trends? We are working on that, updating our, our site so that that's more available. Um, uh, when the site first came up, we had like a map, uh, we had it down to like resignations by state, by country, all of that stuff. Uh, we're trying to get back to that, um, but uh, it is a lot of work. Yeah, uh, and it's um, and we have so many volunteers. It's like it's, but at the same time, we we can't just gr take every volunteer that's willing to offer. We've got to like vet the person and make sure that they understand the consequences. Make sure we know who they are, and then go from there. So we are gonna we are planning to get that back out for you guys, but. It's going to take time. I mean, if, if for the 90,000 people you had by, you know, by gender, by age, yeah. by socioeconomic status, by education level, geographical region, yep. like reasons for resigning, wouldn't that be a wealthy, a wealth of information? Yes. And we almost have all that information. And with this new website or this rebrand that we're doing, we will include questions like that. Yeah. For, for things going forward, but yes, not, sir. not for the past. What do you, what do you think? Do you have any trend? Do you have any visibility at all into the overall trends? Like, do you have an estimate for how many people resign each year? I don't, and I'm sorry for that. But do you even have a guess? We could look into it. Uh, I could, I could actually get you exact numbers at some point. My estimate is between twenty and forty thousand a year. That's my. You think like outside of like yeah, all together? Overall, overall, yeah, yeah. I have no idea. Do you see the number? I mean, I know there are these big spikes. Overall, you know, year after year, do you see it flat, increasing, or decreasing through your website? Uh, I would say flat, yeah, with the spikes. But uh, on average, I would say it's it's just it's how many about a year on average? You I'd said? say twelve to thirteen thousand a year. Okay, okay, yeah, there's a lot. 
that that just don't go through you don't know about you or just stop going to you. church yeah you just stop attending yeah but that's not resignations sure um do the faithful statisticians over at the Kamora project which is an amazing site go to Kamora project to see really in-depth statistics of membership rates activity rates trends uh Kamora project is great do the people of the Kamora project reach out to you for info to include in their stats any cooperation with the Kamora project not that i'm aware of this is the first i've heard of the Kamora project but uh i'd be happy to talk with them see what we can help with okay so one of the biggest questions we have is why why don't you charge for this how are you make how are you making ends meet why don't you uh, charge as a service you know uh donations why don't you accept donations uh, and then people are like, how can we financially, what are your financial needs? What are your costs? What's your revenue? How can people support you? All that stuff. So I do, we do accept donations, uh, right there on the site. Uh, we, people send me, you know, $5 cash every once in a while, uh, that kind of thing, which we put into the 501c3 account. Um, so you fill out a 990 every year? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, um, but I, when I started doing this, I said it will be free and it will always be free as long as I'm alive. Yeah, I shouldn't have said that, <laughs> but, uh, uh, I don't think people, I mean, they've had enough money taken from them, uh, to, to be a part of all of this. I just feel like it's really not that, especially with all the volunteers and things I get, it's really not that much work for me. It's like uh, a calling. Yeah, I guess, <laughs> but it's, and I, I, we do get plenty of donations. Uh, so like, I mean, uh, Ryan and I both take a small salary for the work that we do. I, I, uh, 400 bucks a month or something like that for the work that we do. Uh, and then we, you know, buy paper, we buy ink, you know, we pay for some server space, uh, that kind of thing. So, uh, our financial needs are, are minimal. Uh, if you, you know, if you ever want to donate, we had a $10,000 donation last year, which Whoa. was incredible. Um, and they said, what are you going to do with this money if I give you $10,000? And I said, I'm going to put it in a, the bank account and just let it sit there. Uh, and if we ever need it, if we ever want to put up a billboard, if we ever get to that point, we might do it. Um, but for now, we're, we're very low cost, uh, uh, volunteer based, uh, almost everything that we do. And, uh, but you know, we always welcome donations. We have big plans. Uh, there's always, you know, always dreams that you could do something more. Um, but uh, for now, it, things are pretty low cost. Beautiful. So if, if people want to support you financially, go to quitmormon.com. And your your 990s are probably publicly available so people can see. They should be, yeah. Yeah. I, can't. I mean, if you, fill, if you make under $50,000 a year. Yeah. You fill out the 990 EZ. That's us. And I don't think easy. That's you. Yeah. You're not over 50,000. No, definitely not. So you, you aren't required to disclose lots of financial details just because your relative donations are so small. I guess that makes sense. Uh, but we are again with this rebrand and, and what we're going to put on the website, the plan is to do more of a reporting on exactly where donations go. Um, and, you know, staffing, supplies, all that kind of stuff, and give a better report of that every month. If we want to be big time, we got to act big time, I guess. Um, some people are asking whether eight years old is, uh, in your opinion, the right age to make such severe and significant commitments, lifetime commitment to, to the church and that, well, that sort of thing. Like my wife always says, your brain isn't fully developed until you're 25 years old. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, any young people we meet, we generally are advising them against getting married until they at least turn 25 years right. old. We're usually saying, Hey, don't have a kid at 19. Your yeah. kid's not going to get the best parent, right? I'm an average parent right now at 36. <laughs> so I can't imagine 19 year old Mark trying to like teach children yeah. and take care of them. So no, of course not. Uh, and you know what? You wonder how many members you would have if you had to wait till you were 18 to get baptized. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I've always thought about that. Yeah. Jacob asks, have you received or experienced any intimidation tactics from the church, threats of reporting you to the state board, pressure from Mormons in your personal life, uh, family members who are true believers getting heat? And I would just add, you know, hate mail, 
you know, or threats or intimidation, anything like that? I get a decent amount of hate mail, not as much anymore. Uh, right when, uh, you know, when I went on CNN and- uh, You were on, on CNN? Yeah, Yahoo News. And I think I was in international business or something like that. Um, I got threats. Hmm. Um, but since then, I actually get more threats as an immigration lawyer. <laughs> in the last two years, four years, uh, than I ever did for Quit Mormon. Uh, as far as family goes, they just pretend it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. I've had like, you know, when a little kid uh, says what their parents have been saying behind the scenes, uh, but they're not supposed to say it. I had my like 10 year old niece walk up to me at my dad's funeral. And at the funeral, I had uh, long hair, and braids, um, and both my, both, uh, you know, French braids. And, uh, she walks up to me and goes, you're evil. <laughs> <laughs> you're weird. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I know this isn't just coming from your little kid brain. I know that mom and dad have said some things behind the scenes, but they will never even acknowledge that this is something that I do. Mm -hmm. Um, my family still tries to just do the, um, no one talks about what Mark does in his free time. Mm. Uh, it's just, it's just off limits because I just don't think that it would, they don't think it would be constructive. I think. Yeah. Um, on the flip side of that, have you ever, what can you tell us about inspiring emails or letters or conversations you've had with people where kind of what, your service and what this act has, has meant to people. I've received hundreds, thousands of emails, calls, um, notes. Uh, some of the sweetest ones are like 12 year old kids who like draw a picture and send to me. Um, I get, you know, elderly ladies, the 83 year old lady or the 89 year old lady calling and talking for an hour, telling me how much it means to her to, to be able to make this statement for their transgender grandchild. Um, uh, it's it, yeah. The support is far outweighs any negative that I even get from my own family. Um, it's, it's actually pretty overwhelming. I mean, that that's really touching the grandparent resigning for their transgender grandchild. Any other types of stories like that? Cause I think that really, helps convey the emotional import because, because what you do is important. You're an important player. You know, I, I think I have the authority to say that you're an important player in this space. And I don't think that's going to be a surprise to anyone who listens. So what you do really means a lot to a lot of people. And I just want to give you a chance to convey it uh, emotionally because you know, the emails, the, the comments are overwhelming of people about how great they are for what you do. So uh, what, what, any other types of stories like that? I've just, I mean, I've received emails like people who say that this process saved their life. They were consi considering suicide, which is terrifying to me uh, because, you know, Kurt McConkie wants to blockade me. I hope someone doesn't do something because of that. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, I just, uh, I never, I've only met two or three. When I first put this up on Reddit, uh, I said, Hey, and I'll buy you your first beer once we get your confirmation, which is what I did with my friends. Um, and it just, it actually is never materialized where I've actually got to meet a lot of people. Um, there's been times where people wanted to like throw like Exmo parties and that kind of thing. It's just never kind of materialized, but just, uh, you can tell, I mean, for someone to even sit down and write, take a, you know, take a pen, write a note, um, go get a money order for $5 and mail that to me. Uh, it just shows me that how much people really do appreciate and are, are grateful for that. I mean, how many times do I not even send a thank you note for like a gift I receive? Right. But people it's, it's, it's nonstop emails, calls, uh, mail, uh, of people who are grateful for that step in their life. And it means, it does mean a lot to me. I do feel like, um, yeah, I don't know if, if I can figure out a way to keep doing this and even expand it to even outside of Mormonism or, you know, expand doing good. Uh, that's, that's kind of where my head's at right now. 
That was one of the questions I was going to ask next. Somebody asked if you've considered doing this type of service for Jehovah's Witnesses or Scientologists or other members of other churches. I have. And we are so far behind on making this right, right for Mormonism yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that yeah. we're just not there yet. And at some point, this is going to click uh, where we've got a proper board of directors uh, and financials, and we find, you know, we get grants. It takes a while. Yeah. At some point, we're going to click and we're going to be, like I said, we're going to be, we'll, we might be big time someday, uh, but we got to act big time to get there. And, and we're, takes a while. we're working on it. Yeah. Um, Paul asks, if you were an Avenger, which one would you be and why? Oh, man. I don't <laughs> do you like do the Avengers? Any superhero stuff. <laughs> but. My my friend, I went and saw the last one with him, which is like Endgame. Endgame. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Iron Man. Like the guy is a <laughs> jerk, right? That's why they. That's why they cast Robert Downey Jr. because he's like a jerk in real life. Mm -hmm. But that's the coolest. Like invent stuff all day and have your home completely automated. I'd probably do Iron Man. All right. <laughs> is it hard to? have a su successful law practice and have a family and do this on the side. So I've set up my life in a way that I work from home. Uh, I'm at home with my family all day, every day for better or for worse. Mm -hmm. um, but I just jump from one thing to the other. I'm, you know, clicking quit Mormon resignations, one minute answering an email about quit Mormon to completing a green card application to changing a diaper. Um, and, um, I'm extremely lucky that it's, that it is that way. If I had a job where I had a boss who was demanding, uh, you know, certain amount of hours and, you know, I can't, you know, spending time doing quit Mormon stuff is company, you know, wage theft. Uh, this would be a big, big problem. And then I have to come home to my family for three hours before I got to go to sleep. That would be, I don't think I could do it. Um, but the way my life's set up and the way things are, I, I think it's great. Yeah. That's great. Um, if, if someone wants to seek your legal services in other ways, not related to quitmormon.com, what are the, what are the most common legal services you provide as an attorney if they want to use you for other things? The only thing I do are family-based immigration cases. So you marry a non-citizen or you're a non-citizen, you marry a citizen, you have a fiance overseas, which a surprising number of my clientele are, are Mormon missionaries who've returned home with a girlfriend from Brazil or Korea or wherever it is. Um, I, I don't ever ask them, but I always think, did you Google me before, <laughs> you know, before we, uh, sat down here? Um, so family-based immigration is all I do. Um, and, uh, I've never, uh, I've never, I think maybe two or three times I've had someone not hire me or not come back to me. And I only suspected it was because of what I do is quit Mormon. Um, but I've never actually had someone tell me like, I'm not, I'm not working with you cause you're the devil. So. <laughs> I mean, before today, maybe you would have never had a chance for many people to kind of put, put the name to the face. Sure. After this interview airs, I guess there's a chance more will will identify you and you might get stopped more often. <laughs> well, I, that would be all right. You don't mind? I don't mind. I'd be happy to say hello. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, um, any, any final words you want to say to our audience? Any final instructions? Any inspiring closing thoughts or words? Anything you want to say before we close? Um, Anything no. I didn't ask that you want to answer or? Wish I'd asked. It was my pleasure to be here. I'm glad we finally got it worked out. Um, I just, I do want to, and maybe people will see this as like me trying to like reduce my responsibility. And maybe I am. Um, I'm here to help you make that step in your brain that we talked about that barrier. Like, okay, I'm free. I, and if it could be, and if I could put it in your, you know, if I could make you live the way I think you should, it should be, I'm free and I never want to think about that stuff again. Or I'm free and that stuff doesn't make me emotional again. Or I'm free and 
Uh, you know, I don't care what the bishop says to me or what the neighbor kid says to my eight year old because I'm healthy enough. I've moved beyond this that it's like, oh, you want to get baptized? Okay, let's go to church for three hours and see what that's like, right? <laughs> uh, I had I had a friend who uh, I was telling. I'm a known Santa ruiner, like, like exposing that Santa doesn't exist. And I really try, I don't try to do to it. children, to children. <laughs> and, and I actually made, I told my friend the other day, I, it appears I do it for adults with God as well. <laughs> um, but, uh, she said like, Hey, if you ruin Santa for my kids, I'm going to teach your kids about Mormonism. <laughs> and I was like, my kids are going to know all about Mormonism. I'm not, it, it's not, it's fine. I want them to know as yeah. much as possible. Yeah. So, uh, it is, it is hard. And like I said, it took me 20 years before I was at that point, but this leaving, leaving the Mormon church is not a letter that you get from Curtin and Conkey or church headquarters. Leaving the Mormon church is, is your, you have to recover. You have to reprogram. You have to figure out how am I going to proceed in this world that now doesn't make any sense to me because I was taught it's this way. So, uh, and that's why I say, uh, and Tiffany Perigo, uh, shout out to her. She's the one who contacted me and said, quit Mormon needs to be more. We need to create, uh, uh, a way for people to reach out to therapists, to get community to find ways to move on with their lives. And she set that all up. We have events now on the website uh, you can go see those events, join them. Uh, and we're going to continue to expand that. And I've, I've realized that clicking a button isn't enough for me as a, as like the founder of quit Mormon. And it's not enough for my clients either. Um, there's more to it than just getting that letter back. Yeah. Okay. So you're going to be, uh, events, therapists. Um, we already have them on the website. They're already there. Uh, there's April events that you can join. There's zoom meetings and community meetings. Uh, and there's a list of therapists who've agreed to offer free or very low cost services for people transitioning out of Mormonism. Nice. How'd you decide who to include and who not to include? So I'm actually leaving most of it up to Tiffany. Okay. Uh, and I did say to her, Tiffany, when I started doing this, I'd have pastors reaching out to me being like, Hey, do I have 30,000 new, you know, people that I can, you can tell them about my church? Like, no, that's not the, <laughs> no, that's not how we're doing this at all. Yeah. Um, so, but she's getting licensed therapists, uh, people who we don't think are snake oil salesmen who aren't there to take advantage of you. Um, and if we, and we are actively participating in these groups as well ourselves. Um, so we're, and is this mostly Utah or, uh, I believe she's got, she's from Boise actually. She's at Boise state. Okay. Um, so I, we've got them in Idaho and Utah at least right now. And we're always looking to expand fun. Well, fun. Well, uh, yeah. Oh, last question. Do you ever have people, what, what, how common is it for somebody to push the button and then like reach out later and say, Oh, wait, I, I would take it back. I I'm, I'm now scared or I got cold feet or I changed my mind. Not that common with, uh, the, uh, notaries. I mean, that's quite a few steps you have to take. Yeah. Like I said, can't just do that on a Saturday night. Um, so it used to be a thing like 10%. No, know, I, I one out of a hundred. Maybe. So 1%. Yeah. 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 And I've had, there's been, uh, I do think I'll just say this one last thing. There was uh, a case uh, where a guy in Australia, uh, it appears his teenage daughter, or at least he alleges his teenage daughter took his ID and used that mm. so that she could resign from the church. Mm. Uh, and so he filed complaints with the Utah bar, the California bar, the Washington bar, uh, all came back with me being absolved of any, you know, uh, yeah. malintent or negligence, but I'm fairly certain that, uh, Kurt McConkey pushed the, Hey, here's the phone number for this one. <laughs> you know, here's how you, here's how you complain about this stuff. Encourage, maybe encourage them to complain about you. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Uh, and that's kind of a common threat they like to do too. Well, we'll be contacting the bar. Like, okay. <laughs> I call them all the time. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, but now that people have to I uh, sign with the notary public. You're getting less, you know, kind of like almost none. Yeah. Okay, Occasionally I'll get the person who says like, I had a mental break yeah. and when I did all this stuff and it, it wasn't even me, like 
meaning like the person they are today, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I just have to say, I'm sorry. You've, you know, we have a yeah. notarized document. Right. So. Have you, the church likes to go around and tell people that a lot of people that resign are getting rebaptized, rejoining the church. Have you ever, have you ever heard that? Uh, not that I know of. Yeah. No, I mean, but that's weird because I don't hear from them being like they, your client contacted my client, yeah, <laughs> right? right? When they want to rejoin, it's no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I haven't, I haven't heard of that. What I have heard is I, before Curtin McConkey got involved, I would get a bishop reaching out to me being like, Hey, I'm just trying to do what's best for brother so-and-so. Uh, you know, and we communicate and then I'd say, um, you know, well, he just doesn't want to be contacted. So if you have anything to say to him, send it to me and I'll make sure, you know, he hears about it. Mm -hmm. And then I'll contact brother so-and-so and say, uh, your bishop gave me this letter. Do you want it or not? Mm -hmm. uh, but anyways, uh, when that happened, uh, about a year later, the same, one of those times, uh, the same bishop contacts me and goes, hey, we had a, we talked to each other a year ago, and now I want to use your services. No. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, oh, that's way cool. Uh, you like <laughs> So former bishops? Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. We've had many former bishops, some former stake presidents as well. Oh, fun. So, yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter, but like whatever works for people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mark Noggle, I'm be, you know, uh, today I'll, I'll jokingly – uh, invoke myself as a spokesman for all progressive and post-Mormons, uh, tongue in cheek, but on behalf of all of us, thank you so much for your service, for your, uh, for your voluntary service to help people through something that's very emotional and very challenging. You've helped a lot of people. So many people are grateful for what you've done. And so on behalf of all of us, uh, my listeners, thank you so much. Thanks for coming on Mormon stories to tell uh, your story. Thanks for what you do. And thanks for what you're going to be doing in the future to help people through a transition that is way, way harder than it should be. Absolutely. It's my yeah. pleasure. Thanks for having me on. And if people want to reach out to you, contact you, how do they do that? Quitmormon.com, quitmormon.org. Um, people find my phone number and email all the time, but uh, you're and you're always welcome to contact me that way as well. Um, uh, but I am a busy person, so I might, it might take me some time to get back to you. All right. All right. Thanks, Mark. Great to see you. Me and uh, listeners, uh, thanks for your questions. Loved having your questions today. Thanks for everyone who supports. Um, well, I'll just say, please support Mark. Please send him a little money. Send him some cash. Send him some donations. Again, it's a 501c3, so he has to report uh, these things. Uh, people, if we don't financially support people who do their work, um, then their work goes away and that's not good. We lost John Larson, you know, from Mormon expression podcast because, uh, we didn't support him. There are other podcasts that have come and gone, uh, other services. And so please support quit Mormon financially, become a, a donor, uh, help them out, throw them a bone, whatever you want to do. Thanks to everyone who has supported them. And I just want to make a direct call for others to, to support them as well. Please spread the word and let other people know about this service. Um, and I want to end by just thanking everyone who supports me and the Open Stories Foundation. Those of you who do no donate to Mormon Stories allow us to be able to do interviews like this, not only to raise awareness, but to record history uh, for, the, for the record books. So I'm really proud of that. We now have all, over 1,500 hours of content. So thanks to everyone who supports us to make this possible. We are losing donors every week due to COVID, due to financial shifts, due to people just moving on. So I have to ask this every time, because we're always losing donors, if you want to keep this up, the studio, the online presence, all the support services that we offer, we need people to replace those who drop off. So please become a monthly donor. If you uh, aren't already, go to mormonstories.org, click on the donate button at the top of the page. You can use credit card, whatever, PayPal, Stripe and uh, become a monthly donor. You can go to Venmo at Mormon Stories, um, you know, however you can. Uh, if you want to support us and keep us alive, please do. Uh, we're 100% financially transparent. Uh, we we share our finances. We have since the very beginning. Um, and uh, all of the money goes towards this type of uh, service and content. And less than one out of a thousand people who listen or view our stuff actually donate. So 
if if just if we could just make that two percent instead of one percent, uh, we'd we'd be able to exist for hundred more years or more. Maybe even get more of a staff together to be able to do more good things. So please become a donor. Please uh, spread the word. Give us positive reviews on Mormon Stories Podcast Facebook page or on uh, the Apple Podcast app. Um, follow us on Instagram. Follow us on Twitter. And uh, email us with feedback at mormonstories at gmail.com. Comment either at mormonstories.org or on YouTube or on Facebook. Um, and just be good to each other. Uh, love each other. Be kind. And uh, huge thanks to Gerardo Simano for the cinematography and Brooklyn Alden for doing the editing along with my board of directors that helps keep the nonprofit on the straight and narrow. Uh, thanks to all your support. You guys stay in touch and we'll see you guys all again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories podcast. Take care, everybody.